Okay, I think we'll get started since we only have an hour. So, yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's discussion. My name is Erica Chenoweth, and I'm a professor here at Harvard Kennedy School and uh, at the Ash Center. Before we begin, I'd like to make a few announcements on behalf of the Ash Center. The Ash Center acknowledges the land on which Harvard University sits is the traditional territory of the Massachusetts people. We also recognize the continuing presence of the neighboring Wampanoag and Nempuk nations. Today's discussion is being recorded and will be publicly available on the Ash Center's YouTube channel at the conclusion. Now onto a couple of framing points before I introduce our wonderful panelists. First, data that we maintain at the Nonviolent Action Lab, where the four of us are connected, suggests that we live in an era of people power. Since Mahatma Gandhi popularized the technique of civil resistance in the 1920s and 1930s, use of people power to fight oppressive regimes and dictatorships has diffused and accelerated worldwide. So far in the first 24 years of our current century, there have been more mass people power movements trying to topple dictatorships than there were in the entire 20th century. But the paradox is that over the past 15 years, we have also seen a steep and troubling decline in the ability of these movements to achieve their goals. Instead, autocratic governments are defeating pro-democracy campaigns at rates not seen since the 1930s. So our panel today consists of people who have seen what that looks and feels like on the ground. Today, we invite their reflections about what might explain this trend what they've experienced, and how we might learn from them to support democracy movements going forward. Freddy Guevara Cortez is a political leader, freedom fighter, and democracy advocate. He co-founded the Venezuelan progressive party Voluntad Popular in 2010, was the top voted congressman in 2015, vice president of Venezuela's parliament in 2016, and leader of the nonviolent civil uprising against Maduro's dictatorship in 2017. As a result of his political activism, Guevara became a target of political persecution, resulting in the loss of his freedom for three years. During this time, he was a refugee in the Chilean assembly, uh, embassy in Caracas, a political prisoner, and is in exile since August of 2021. He was appointed to the opposition unitary platform in negotiations with Maduro's regime, and in 2023 as president of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Venezuelan parliament in exile. Shadi Aghazali Harb is one of the most prominent youth activists from the Egyptian revolution in 2011 during the Arab Spring, and he was involved in all subsequent changes in government. He graduated from Harvard Kennedy School in 2023 with a master's in public administration. The New York Times, Washington Post, BBC, and numerous other international publications have covered his activism and analysis, and among other things, he is a medical doctor. Maria Kuznetsova is a Russian human rights defender and pro-democracy activist. Ex-spokesperson for OVD Info Human Rights Medium Project, the biggest organization in Russia providing coverage and legal help for protesters and political prisoners, and she worked mostly for the ones protesting against the war. Since the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, Maria worked with international media and diplomats to provide information on the international situation in the country, and develop policies on current Russian regime and Russian political exiles. Currently, Maria is an HKS MPP 2025 candidate. So uh, the format for this evening will be that we'll briefly hear uh, from each of our panelists about uh, what key lessons they have learned fighting dictatorship in recent years. Um, and then we'll have some conversation among us. We'll reserve time for questions from you, the audience, for the last 20 minutes of this hour. So with that, I think we'll go uh, initially in the order in which I introduce you. So Freddie, you'll be up first, followed by Shadi, and then Maria. Good. Well, thank you, everyone. Thanks for being here. Thanks also, I think it's too loud, right? A little bit. It's good? Okay. Thanks to the Arch Center and also to the Global Democracy Caucus. Khaled and I co-shared that space and all of you for being here. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do some reflections uh, about especially how my assessment of this type of struggles have changed since I'm here. And this comes from personal reflections, life experiences, my work with, with Erica and with my fellow companions. But I will, I will also use some concepts that many of you will find um, that resemble some concepts 
from Erika's class of civil resistance, a strategy action for human rights class with Doug Johnson, leadership 201 and 202 with O'Brien and Heifetz, uh, PDIA with Matt Andrews, also thinking analytic in a certain world with Levy and some others as behavioral science and rationality and other, other classes. So you will maybe hear some concepts that, that are used in those classes. So the, the first reflection that I want to say is that fighting dictatorships is not a take, it's not a it's not a recipe. And what does it mean in, in terms of uh, high fits framework? It's not a technical challenge. It's an adaptive challenge. And before, I used to think that you know, I was I a big, I am still a big follower of Jane Sharp's uh, nonviolent theory, but I have to say that all the trainings and things and readings that you get during your formation as a civil system leader may mislead you to, a, to an idea that this is a thing that, okay, you get people in the streets, then you do this and for many days, and then at the end, the dictatorship is over. And the reality is more complex. Of course, you have big principles that can guide your struggle, but it's not a recipe. It's not A plus B plus C, and then you will have a solution. So. It's not a thing about best practices, right? So then you say, no, in South Africa, this happened. Well, South Africa is very different than Venezuela. Oh, no, oh, this happened in, in, I don't know, in Egypt. Well, what happened in Egypt doesn't work in Cuba. So even though it's interesting, of course, to know those things, and this is also the PDIA model, it's more problem driven. So try to look at your reality and understand it that not as a process to follow, uh, you know, like how to make a cake. But understanding that it's more of a dynamic thing. And another concept from the strategy team for human rights is understanding the strategy is not a plan that then you make and then you follow. It's a process, the strategizing. It's a thing that you keep evolving and you need to permanently go back and review and adapt to the situation. The second one is that protests and mobilizations aren't enough. And that social movements alone doesn't make change. If you don't have politics, if you don't have negotiation, if you don't have understanding and building co bigger coalitions with other stakeholders, if you don't build an structure that will be able to sustain the country, you will not have achieve change because no one jumps from the void, from the instability to avoid, right? So I think that when we see in a lot of countries, like when you have these no people's movement and just people's movements, well, you have to think about also the military and the police guy and the elites that are in the regime and the international community also that will say, well, okay, what happens if the dictatorships uh, get out? And maybe Chad will reflect more on that, but that happens a lot, of, you know, in, in what happens in the Arab Spring that people say, oh, if the dictator is gone, then we, what we have is Libya or Syria, right? The third thing would be that my situation and our situation in Venezuela is not an isolated case. One of the first conversations that, that I had with Erika and when I saw Erika's study is that this is a global trend. So it's very unlikely. I mean, we make mistakes, but it's very unlikely that we are in Brazil, but also in Egypt, but also in Russia, but also in, in, in Belarus, but also in Hong Kong, and to all of the same times, all of us are making mistakes. Well, yes, but probably there's also a systemic situation that are changes that get out of the consequence of dictatorships learning and we are not evolving. The fourth one will be that this field could and should use more multidisciplinary approaches. I think that many of us was just trained in mobilizing, organizing, taking people to the streets, blocking streets, maybe even um, being a spokespersons. But there's a lot of things that you could use with behavioral science, decision science, game theory, uh, building bridges, negotiation. But I think that the democratic powers should invest a lot in training people that are fighting in these societies, not only in how to get people in the streets, but also to how to, to really promote sustainable change. And the last one, maybe this is not a reflection just for fighting dictatorships, but most for my Latin general, but it applies a lot in for this thing, is to be more humble. 
and be more comfortable with uncertainty. Be more curious about the beliefs and the interests and the ideas of the opponent or the people that are not on your side. And it's a weird balance that you have to find between, because I am not a relativist, right? I believe there are things that are good and are bad. But at the same time, you have to, you have to be aware that you don't necessarily are in the, you know, you, you, you are not the enlightened one. Because if one of the main things, one of the many strategies that are used to take out dictatorships is bringing the other people that support the dictator to your side, you cannot do that if you think that you are in the moral high, right, in the higher ground. And you are the one that knows the truth and the other ones are just people that either all of them are corrupt, either all of them are evil, or they're just dumb people. You need some try, you, you need some kind of humility and understanding to be actually credible. Because at the end, uh, <laughs> at the end, this is the foundation to actually connect and build the, co the conditions that will make able uh, people that support the regime to step, uh, you know, to make a step ahead and collaborate with a transition. So I will leave it like this and thank you very much. Um, thank you, Erica. Thank you, Freddie. Um, I always like to use more uh, more specific examples um, from the Arab Spring and from especially the Egyptian Revolution because I think it it embodies what real failure is right now, hmm. but not just failure, but it's failure which followed a great success which the whole world witnessed. So it's like a movie. If, if you remember the days of the Arab Spring and, and how we occupied Tahrir Square for 18 days and toppled down um, a long-standing dictator who was in power for 30 years, that was like, you know, it, it was very much like movies and with a happy ending of toppling down the dictator. But unfortunately, the movie doesn't end there. It extends and it gets us to this situation that we're in more than 10 years on now of a more brutal dictatorship, which is more suppressive and more oppressive than the one that we managed to topple down. So that's real life. And um, when I go back to the memories of us celebrating uh, toppling down Mubarak on the 11th of February uh, 2011, and the whole world celebrating with us, by the way, it's, it wasn't just us, and um, the whole world feeling that there is a new wave of empowerment for the people, Go, going back to these moments, the, the, the main thing that makes me persistent to continue the struggle is that I don't think that these moments we were just like tricked or we were um, so naive to think that we are succeeding, but... It was a failure. I, I think that we were on the right way, but something went wrong. And my question, especially since 2013, was what went wrong? What did we do wrong? Of course, us as like the activists, the youth, the youth activists who were on the ground, who were trying to do their best to bring about the, the goals of the revolution, we did a lot of things, a lot of mistakes. And we have to reflect on that and see how to correct them just for our own sake, just for learning, uh, maybe for the next generations. But was that really what went wrong? Was, was that the cause of the failure? It may have played a role, 
but there were many other factors that were much bigger than we could control. And honestly, the, these are the things that I was um, I was more preoccupied with and was trying to find a way of how can we can we fix that if we can fix it. So of course there were like regional factors, regional powers who were not happy with our success. They do not want the democracy to spread. And maybe Freddie, I mean, use the technical term of the adaptive challenge. Yeah, this is an adaptive challenge for us. How can we spread democracy in a region filled with autocracies? It's not just filled with autocracy. It is, I mean, the autocracies are, are rooted in this region for decades, if not centuries. So how can we resist that? How can we challenge that? Bringing down one dictator can seem like a success, but it's definitely not bling, bringing down the dictatorship or the autocracy in the region. It's a much more difficult process. And that's what we witnessed firsthand. Bringing down Mubarak didn't mean that the regime was gone. No, the regime fi found new ways to come back in a stronger, more oppressive manner. And the problem is because we, 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 we literally rocked the world uh, and the world felt the triumph of our success, but there were repercussions for that because the autoc autocrats of the world as well were not happy with this. So there, were, there was like one side who was really happy and celebrating us, but there was another side that was saying, oh no, we should do something about this because if this spreads, we will be threatened. Not just in the region, but I'm talking about the internationally. Because guess what? We are all connected. Even if you're in Asia or Latin America, or which seems geographically very distant, but in, in real terms, they are very connected. So if we manage to, success, to, to succeed, and if this success spreads, they will all be threatened. And I think that they responded in a way which is much more efficient than we, we, we thought they were. And much more efficient of the democracies who were celebrating us responded to our success. So then what we now call as the International Autocratic Alliance I think that they came to full alert at that time that we should do something to stop that. And they did a lot. First of all, they consolidated their, their, uh, their relationships and their know-how of how to suppress people, their technologies, the, everything they, they could help each other to suppress the power of the people, they managed to bring it through. And they cooperated in a way that, again, the democracies failed to cooperate on the other side to consolidate the democracies or the, the emerging democracies that were trying to find their way in very difficult regions. So it was their success that got us into this place. And it was their success that got me here to Harvard to try and find out how can we challenge that? How can we stop that? How can we challenge powers that when we took to the streets, we couldn't imagine that we need to face them? They're much bigger than we expected to have to be forced to be confronting. 
So I think that what we learned here at HKS, it, it made, made it much clearer for us how big the challenge is and what we need to do, which is much more than the grassroots mobilization that we were doing. It doesn't exclude it, but it needs to be put in, in, in its place in terms of one of the many, to, many tools that should be used to set the stage for a true democratic transition that is very much needed in, in these places, in the hotspots, in, in the Middle East, in Latin America, in Russia, in, in Asia. How can we set the stage for such democratic transition to happen? I think that this is the question that we all need to answer. And if we just at least put one, one foot in the right direction, stepping in the right direction, I think maybe we can reverse the very bad statistics that Erica just opened with and get it back to the people's power again as the prevailing power rather than the autocrats. Thank you. Can you hear me? No. Can you use this one? Yeah, this one is easier. Okay, so I actually want to continue on like what Shadi started. Um, why it's so okay? Okay, thanks. So autocrats definitely now see that their survival is interconnected, and even like in their propaganda narratives, you see that they often say that they're afraid of Arab Spring and colorful revolutions that happened like in Eastern Europe. They actually understand that people in their countries also like learn from each other, especially like, for example, in the Arab region, when like one revolution started, people also like saw that in another country. The same like happens in Eurasia when um, Ukraine um, tried to transition to democracy. Other countries, especially like Belarus and Russia and movement saw that. And it became like a huge problem to like Vladimir Putin and Alexander Lukashenko. And that made their transition to even more, um, you know, authoritarian and dictatorial style because like they knew that people can see an alternative. And for them, it's very important to for the people not to have an alternative. It's the same logic um, is with Taiwan because like Chinese government can like see that um, an alternative is possible and it's not in their interest. Um, the problem that I see with all of that um, is that while authoritarian regimes understand that and they help military and like with propaganda and like economically each other, democratic countries and especially US do does not understand that. US logic is still very much realistic and military alliances and the great power game that results in um, alliances with like authoritarian countries, especially like Gulf countries such as Arab Emirates that, for example, in the current situation with the war in Ukraine, they openly, quite openly support Russia in many ways, including extraditing like Russian oppositionists to Russia, not allowing like Ukrainian um, famous people and like singers to come into the UAE while still having like an alliance with the US. So there is like a huge disconnect between like this more like liberal and like human rights and pro-democracy perspective and more like defense style, very realistic perspective. And that's why we don't like see progress. And also um, this more state-based defense perspective lacks understanding that the regions are interconnected. And I feel like it's mostly connected to the fact how like ministries are organized. But what we see now is that, for example, again, like Russia is helping Egypt, Russia is helping Venezuela government because like they understand that they need to help the they kind of peers and like friends in their countries. Um, yeah. Um, one more thing that I wanted to add um, 
is that um, it's also in many ways uh, we need to understand that technologies are connected, especially things like AI and like facial recognition systems that are now widespread around like authoritarian countries. And the same goes um, to American big tech companies such as like Meta and Google who have very different policies in many authoritarian countries and engage in a lot of censorships there. Um, in many situations, I feel like it happens because like they don't really understand what's happening and they feel threatened and they may be blocked there from the market, though sometimes the threats cannot be fulfilled. It's not in the interest of these governments to like block, I don't know, like YouTube. Uh, but still there is like misunderstanding and not understanding that there is more than just commercial interest on their part. Okay, so you, you've all mentioned, and I'm sure everybody's thoroughly depressed at this point, um, but, um, but I do want to talk about um, what setting the stage and taking a step forward actually looks like. So Shadi, you, you sort of made mention of the idea that, you know, mass mobilization is one tool among others. Um, uh, and Freddie, you were talking about the need for um, abandoning the idea that there's a recipe um, and that we need to think about these problems as adaptive, um, which I think is all correct. And, um, you know, to what extent are we talking about fully abandoning uh, the constraints of what we already know about what makes movements win? Uh, versus uh, just providing some upgrades um, around the content that meet the current moment. So where are you on kind of revolutionizing the field versus um, upgrading and advancing the field? I, my personal opinion is that the main core values and th theories, the main core values and concept of a nonviolent theory and civil resistance it's absolutely valid, valid still. What I mean to this is that A, nonviolence is more effective and less costly than violence. And that the way to achieve that is through a collective process in which people practice a little, a lot of uh, civil resistance, civil disobedience, however you want to call it, resistance tactics and strategies that makes the dictators and the people that surrounds them or supports them uh, to create a situation in which the cost to stay in power is higher than the cost of leaving power and achieving a transition. And that you do that by promoting defections, right? So the main thing I think remains, right? I don't think that, uh, especially I was telling to, to Erika that I recently was in, in Israel and went to the border of Gaza and went to the kibbutz that were attacked by Hamas. And at the same time, we're hearing like the bombings and the artillery. And if I had any doubt about nonviolence that day, I, I thought like, okay, no, you know, uh, uh, my, my country at least cannot enter in this void of, you know, who started, who is this, but at the end, you know, the cost is so big, it's thousands of humans life. You know what, in, in our protests in Venezuela, there's like, uh, we, we have, a lot of casualties, hundreds, but we're talking about dozens and thousands of people that get killed in wars or, 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 or violent events. So I still believe that. However, I think that we need to upgrade and understand that the game change and there are some situations that have affected how the people in the 90s and in the 80s were making progress and winning, and those same tactics or strategies are not valid anymore, or at least not valid to all of the different situations. Because I will add one last, one last thing in this topic is also situations evolve, right? Because for example, in the case of Venezuela, um, we defeated Chavez once when we, I was in the student movement, right? But then, the situation evolved on a more authoritarian regime and then became like a full dictatorship. So the tactics that work against Chavez doesn't necessarily work when you are fighting Maduro that he already doesn't need legitimacy, right? So I think that maybe 
the main vision that was established, let's say, in the 80s and 90s in nonviolence may not work for all type of authoritarian regimes at this, in the same way. So now you have a lot of regimes that rely more on uh, paramilitaries instead of officials. You have some regimes that are more uh, related to, instead of like hier hierarchies, more networks. And I think that that's something that needs to be addressed. Um, I agree to all what Freddie mentioned and um, the necessity of us updating. We cannot give up on uh, mobilizing the people and mobilizing the grassroots, especially in uh, within the um, non-violence um, uh, context. This is essential because any movement will not succeed without the people being involved some, some way or the other. Even if you're trying um, uh, for defections, you still need the people to back these defections. Mm -hmm. So that's that's just a given. Another thing that I think that we need to to tackle, if we're talking about the gap gaps that we need to to fill in our updating uh, process, is um, the voids that people are uh, feel can happen and Freddie also touched about touched this point uh when he spoke first i think that this is very important because these are um how the regimes kind of coerce the people into silence coerce them into not um uh going taking the streets to demand some of their demands because they always at least that's in our case they always say well, if if you push it that far, you will have uh, um, um, you you won't have a state, you won't have a country to rely on, and and the Egyptian example they used to say you will end up like Syria and Libya and and Yemen. Uh, so, of course, this scares people. The void scares people. So, how can we? deal with that? How can we offer a narrative that doesn't have this kind of void so that people will be more um, confident that they're going to some somewhere better, not worse? And this will take us to another sensitive issue of how to manage the transition. Because let's be honest, it's never going to be a dictatorship converting into a democracy just like this. This never happens. There has to be a transition. And this transition, I think, is better to be calculated transition rather than a chaotic transition. So how can we bring about this calculated transition, which involves um, calling in all the factions, even the ones that we revolted against. We have also to be realistic. We're not going to be kicking them out of the country or we're not going to be excluding them because excluding them can be a time bomb that you will see its effect in the near future. So how do you involve them in such a transition? And how do you convince at least the regional powers that you will not be a danger threatening them? Because, again, in Egypt's case, this was a major factor that led to the, the collapse of our, um, our hope of democracy transition. So I think that managing the void and the transition are very important questions that need to be addressed before we move on for another attempt to change. Can, I, can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I actually also wanted to continue on that, um, especially what I see with Russia, is that the regime has learned very well how to consolidate elites. And even like with the start of the war in Ukraine, we saw that not that many officials resigned. Yes, there were like very high level officials who left Russia immediately and started to cooperate with Ukrainian authorities. 
uh, and like with Western countries, but there were not like a lot of them. And I think one of the reasons that it happened is that um, Russian pro-democratic movement never wanted to work with them because it was seen as something, you know, as dirty, that you shouldn't work with the government. Um, we call it wearing a white coat when you don't want to in any way work with the people you don't like. And it especially um, increased with the war because like when you are, for example, in Russian opposition and you want to try to um, break elites and switch them to your side, you won't be seen as it will it will it will be seen as a betrayal by Ukrainians and by international society as you kind of like cooperate with war criminals. And that's a big issue because like there is a growing um divide and no one wants to kind of like be in the middle and like try to um you know find a common ground and try to transition to something. And another thing that also like happened with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, there were no pathways uh, for this high level officials to go to the West to get like a political asylum, to get like, uh, I don't know, um, immunity against criminal prosecution in exchange for information about the regime. It was not prepared at all. Even Russian opposition, like people with verified history, faced so many problems when they left the country, not having like bank accounts, not being able to register NGOs, not being able to, um, I don't know, like start anything. Um, my friends are spied a lot by, for example, European intelligence all the time. And that's just a not productive atmosphere because still there's people from authoritarian regimes that have been working for years against um, the dictatorship I still seen as a part of the regime and no one wants to kind of um, try to find yeah a common ground and start the process of you know um, in recruiting the elites yeah. yeah thank you um, it is time to turn to you the audience for your questions if you could um, do we have a mic coming great We'll have a mic coming out, which uh, we hope you'll speak into so that uh, people who are watching online can hear. And let's start over here in the back. Hi, uh, Kieran, MPA student here at the Kennedy School. Uh, just last year, we had a similar panel with uh, Peter Ajak, who joined you, a South Sudanese activist who has since been charged um, for conspiring to export weapons to South Sudan um, by the Department of Justice in the US. Um, and so that leads me to my question to all of you. Um, how do you resist the temptation by yourself or by your fellow uh, uh, activists uh, to use violence uh, to topple dictators? And could you describe moments in your experience um, where you or yourself felt, uh, you or your followers felt that temptation and how you re reacted to that. <laughs> this is recorded. <laughs> okay, yeah. You don't have to answer every question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I can, especially that uh, I shared the panel with Peter, just as you said. And um, I think that it is it is something um, Africa is plagued with this um, conflict that you feel from inside that should I keep doing what doesn't seem to be getting us anywhere while the others the other side is like uh, because they are they're the stronger side. They have weapons. They have support from countries and so on. So how will we ever see a result in our lifetime? This is a question that most of us ask. And I think that Africa is plagued with this question. And especially that you see you see uh, uh, kunditas happening in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa, like every three or four months now we... We see a new one, and they are supported by 
Mother Russia, unfortunately. So it is a very difficult equation and it's not hard for someone to slip into this slippery slope. And from my experience, this similar uh, conversations happened uh, when the military takeover happened in Egypt in 2013. And unfortunately, uh, some of the Islamist factions decided to go down this road, which we all considered afterwards as acts of terrorism. It ruins the, the whole scene of resistance. And that's what it did in Egypt for at least from 2013 to 2016. We tried to resist that as much as we can, but I can't say that they are like close affiliates who did that. They are ones who usually, uh, they're not from the leadership. At least I'm talking about my experience. They're not from the leadership. They are, they are from more from the grassroots and from the less ranking um, uh, organization, less ranking youth within the organizations who give up hope, especially when they're faced by by enormous uh, uh, um, violence. Like, again, with the Egypt example, with what happened in the Rabah massacre in August 2013, that triggered a lot of youth and pushed them towards violence. And this is not a justification, but it's an explanation. And I think I'm I'm really sorry that we have to say this this world war this phrase over and over again. But this is what happened. And no matter what you try to do to tell them not to go to this violent, non-productive uh, uh, pathway. Things are 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 much more uh, tense and heated that you cannot really control the the situation. So it's it's a pity that some do not find the way except going through this pathway because it usually leads to suppression of the peace movement or the peaceful movements. And it gets us back tens of years. That's what happened in our case. And that's what we're trying to regain now in Egypt. Although we don't have any space, honestly, right now to, to make any movement, either peaceful or anything else, nothing at all. But I think I, I, I blame a lot of what we're in now because of the violence that happened between 2013 and 2016. So I hope I hope that any activist who who even is offered with such a temptation should resist this with all his might because this is the only way forward at least to keep the movement alive. If you can't see it winning anytime soon, what well, the least you, you should do is to keep it alive. I, I will just add, um, of course, there's moments when you don't achieve the goal that you can think about, well, is this the right path or not? And I will say that I am not a pacifist, right? I have values, but I am not a pacifist. I, war was important to defeat the Nazis, right? And sometimes violence is used to, to kill criminals that uh, are killing people more. So uh, it's not a thing that I condone every condone, no, the opposite. Um, Condemn, sorry. Uh, condemn all the time uh, violence and like that. But what I do believe is that reality have demonstrated that uh, one thing works better than other. If I would think that violence will achieve the goal with a lesser cost, maybe I would be in a guerrilla or something like that, right? Or doing something like that. But the reality is that it's not. And the, even if it were both equally effective, 
effective in the way that achieving the maximum goal that is a regime change, for example, the cost is so high that do, do you really want to get into that? So in my opinion, it's like, you know, assessing your capacities, understanding that you cannot, uh, if I'm going to fight with Mike Tyson, right, I'm not going to uh, challenge him in a, boxy, in a boxing ring, right? I will challenge him, I don't know, playing PlayStation, whatever, but not, 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 not in a boxing ring, right? So that's a, that, that's a thing that keeps, you know, you, you, you need to keep reminding yourself because of course you can't get in desperation, right? But, but the reality is that that path is less effective and most way more costly for everyone. Yeah, and at the end, you want people to, to live and be free. And basically with violence, you're killing people. Even if you're not doing it, and in the, but in all the, the situation, more people will die. Thank you for speaking to us and sharing your experience. Uh, I'm Veronica, I'm CMPA. Uh, I have a question. I'm not a specialist in any of the the, the countries or the movements you, you you acted into, but I wanted to hear your thoughts on how do you feel about breaking the barrier between what you started, which I, in my in my view, it has a little bit of uh something of coming of an intellectual elite of something that doesn't belong to what i would call a common citizen line of thought and how do you interpret the way that maybe that uh, whatever you started in your own countries didn't break this whether uh, to a bigger thing or like to get uh, big enough in order to to achieve the highest goal which you began with it does that make sense um so how do you get cross-class participation thank you <laughs> in a tweet yes Freddie, you should start with this one maybe and then maria yeah um in venezuela um we have different we have had different moments so there was a moment in which chavez had popular support right I oppose that guy all my life, but I cannot deny that he had popular support. Sometimes more, sometimes less, but he had popular support. Maduro is like very little the support, so it's, it's a different situation. I'm not saying that Chavez is better. I'm saying that's different situations. So in that, in the case of Chavez, um, our way to do that was talking more about values. And there was an interesting debate because a lot of people say like, no, you have to talk to, about, to poor people about what they... Uh, need about the food and the water and the thing. And actually we won against Chavez talking about values, freedom and, and equality. And, and freedom means different things from different people, right? Maybe for me, freedom is freedom of speech, but other one freedom is freedom to buy what I want to buy, right? And the freedom to decide what my kid is going to learn. So uh, during the Chavez era for us, like really sticking into values was something that, that, was, uh, that helped us to cross different sections of society, not only in class, but also in different ideologies. Uh, in Maduro is different because 80% of the people it's against him. So I don't think that necessarily, uh, we have to be aware that even if you get to manage uh, a unity of all the country, maybe that's not enough. And, maybe, and that's not enough because precisely it's not a democracy. If it was a democracy, you just have the majority and you topple them. But, that will be my, my take on this. Maria, in Russia, economic issues are very important. I would say that, um, yeah. <laughs> I would say that the one thing that actually helped to unite like people cross class before the war was actually, yes, talking about economic policy and corruption. And it was like Alexei Navalny and his breakthrough through YouTube, Russia, hasn't had any free TV for like 20 years. And that basically made YouTube the biggest independent political platform. So it's basically independent TV now. It's more political than in most countries. Um, the way was, um, the, the way like what Navalny did was talking about not only corruption on like the highest level, because like mm -hmm. many people would say, yeah, we know that they do that, but it doesn't impact our life. 
Um, he also talked about regional politicians, about how money from like the city budget went to this corrupt mayor and that prevented your children from like having a new hospital for, yeah, I don't know, cancer research or something like that. It was trying to connect the federal government and regional government and what was happening on the ground because like especially Russia is a huge country and they always, um, what the government tries to show in their propaganda is that Putin is good and he doesn't know what elites do on like regional level. So people don't like regional elites because they see they're corrupt. They see that their regions do not develop, but they don't make a logical connection between that and federal government actually enforcing that. They believe that they just don't see it. Then like the Tsar is far away and he just doesn't know what happens. But if we able to say to him what is happening he will actually help us because he's a good guy and he believes in like equality or whatever so trying to make the link of how the system works was very helpful but i would also say that um russia is not that um i would say diverse as many countries in way in, like it is diverse but still it's very informationally united it's not that we have like a lot of like regional media and things like mm. that but on the scene of failures i would say that russian pro democracy movement until like the last two years never engaged with uh, movements um, in like national republics and with movements on of like indigenous peoples at all it was very moscow federal centered without trying to understand regional opposition and like regional elites and like maybe their aspirations because um they were like russia has like 200 languages and oh. there was no attempt to in, in recruit regional elites and like to talk about their aspirations and like it was like in many ways because also part of Russian opposition like 20 years ago was like pro-nationalist and like pro-creating like, you know, national state after USSR. But yeah, um, I think it was like, there is a huge need of trying to connect, especially in big countries between federal and regional on yeah both levels. Time for one more. Um, let's go so hard, I think, both of your questions, but keep them very brief if you can. And then we'll my question is, uh, so we've seen cases where movements succeeded after 20 or 30 years of repression. And the reason was because they were able to maintain solidarity networks and maintain a sense of collective identity. How do you see your countries being able to do that when most activists are either in exile or in prison? Mm. Uh, thank you all. Um, my question about the issue of representation. Um, so basically, when um, if you look at Venezuela before 2013, Egypt in 2014, 15, um, I just came from India today. The majority of people saying, "Go Modi." Like some, so people say, "Like ah, we don't care about democracy." So when this happened, who do we represent, and how do we decide? Like, what's our strategy? Should we think about quiet revolution, working with people, or we still? Um, target um, the top level or governments or dictators. Great. Easy questions for the last three minutes. Um, so why don't you each uh, take one of the two and we'll try to make sure they both get addressed collectively. Well, we'll start. Yeah. Okay. I can start with the question about like, um, you know, activists emigrating and things like that. Um, yeah, yes, while many prominent activists and journalists are in exile, people are still inside the country. We saw that like with Russia, Russia had like elections two days ago. And though people who were able to speak and call for action were abroad because of the internet, um, people inside the country were able to unite. And we saw huge crowds outside of polling stations because what the position did is they called everyone to come to the polling station at midday at the same time because like there is no possibility to count the vote but when you have like visibility of people standing outside at the same time you see how many people are against um people are inside the country there is a problem of um disconnect between the ones who are in exile and the ones inside the country especially when many years come 
Um, yeah, that's like, I feel like what we have to address. No, I would say just two things regarding collective identity. I think that's a key challenge because you have, I will refer to two bad examples and two good examples. Two bad examples of that, Cuba and Iran, right? In Cuba, you, you feel this division between the people, the Cubans that are in Miami and the Cubans that are in the island, very different. And in Iran, you feel like people are outside and all of them like even supporting the previous Shah and the people that are in the field is very different, right? So that's a thing to avoid. You have two examples that are not related to dictatorships that very, uh, in, in the situation actual, is like the actual situation is Jews and Palestines. Both of them were capable of sustaining their identity even if they weren't in the same place, right? So I think that remaining and hung, um, holding on into values, traditions, and keep communication, right? That's something very important. And that's something that we're trying to work now because we are a new day diaspora. Venezuela was a country that people went to Venezuela. Now we are in, in the exile and it's very different. And for representation, I think that's a, that's a, key, a, a key topic. Um, in our experience, not necessarily you can do it in all the other places. Whenever you can have people voting, even if it's not an official thing, that helps a lot. Or legitimacy, when I was a student leader, I started, it was because the students voted for me. And then we did primaries also in the opposition. So even if you're in autocracy, but you can vote in a thing for your leaders, I think that's something very important because, uh, of course, legitimacy in the, uh, the exercise of power, it's also important. But the origin of legitimacy, I think that's something that for us have, has worked very well. I have a short answer for both of them. Yeah. <laughs> both of both of the questions at the same time, I think they're very important questions, but now we are in an era which they can be answered by the same tool, which is social media. At least in Egypt's case, social media acts as a very important tool to keep us together, keep us um all those who are in exile um, are still con very much connected, very much um, following what's happening and interacting. And um, also to, to answer the question of representation, we do not have any kind of free election in Egypt. So the only way to vent is also through social media. So this is like our window to what is happening on the ground. And I think that uh, we have to remain connected through this window to what's happening there. Because, I mean, this is, again, the, the, the root of any movement for change comes from the people who we are trying to represent. So if we keep this channel open and if we keep this channel between us um, to maintain our collective uh, uh, being um, connected to the to the streets in Egypt, I think that we will get to the stage that you said that, that um, might come in years, 10 or 20 years, that this movement can manifest itself in the streets. So... I guess until now, we do not have any other new tool. Uh, the Arab Spring and, and, and Egypt in particular were always like highlighted by their use of social media and use of Facebook and Twitter. Uh, and I'm all, always like hoping for a, a new tools to be, uh, uh, to be used in this arena. But until now, we we only have the same tools of the social media that are doing okay. I wouldn't say that they are the best, but they are okay in, in at least fulfilling these two uh, criteria. Thank you so much uh, to all three of you and to all of you for joining us today and uh, appreciate very much the Global Democracy Caucus and the Ash Center for supporting